Okay, so um, this is the second in the series of the development of heart lectures. And uh, in the previous lecture, we covered the general uh, development of the uh, primitive heart tube and how it has been folding and accommodating itself in the uh, uh, pericardial cavity. And uh, then we uh, spoke of the development of uh, the uh, atrial chambers and the partitioning of the atrioventricular canal. So let's have a look at this lecture. Uh, uh, so these are the learning objectives which you are supposed to fulfill by the end of this uh, topic. And let's see, there is like a this is the overview I was talking about, that uh, the cardiogenic area, which is making the primary heart field, and uh, that is located uh, at the cranial end of the embryonic disc. And these are the two primitive endocardial tubes, which are very flimsy, thin, uh, thin walls, uh, thin wall tubes, because they are formed by the endothelial cells. And then uh, we know that they are surrounded by the splanchnic mesoderm. Uh, or the, the mesoderm, which is uh, making these structures of the pharyngeal arches. It surrounds the, these endocardial tubes, and that is going to help in the formation of the cardiomyocytes and like the other, other two layers of the heart uh, as a whole, like because in the in, inside or the inner lining of the heart, heart, which is pretty much a hollow organ, the inner lining has been formed by the endothelium, so we call it endocardium. And then the middle layer is purely muscular, that is the myocardium, and the topmost layer is the epicardium. So we just have discussed the, uh, the role of, uh, of uh, uh, cardiac jelly in the previous lecture. So you have to keep that fact in mind while looking at these sketches. Uh, then they will, as a result of uh, foldings, these two tubes will fuse uh, in the midline, and the cranial end, which is the outflow tract, will stay paired, while the caudal end, which is the inflow tract, will, that will also stay uh, uh, paired. The middle portion is free. The uh, outflow tract is also fixed because uh, they're, they're, it's hanging down from the pharyngeal arches in front. And the inflow tract is also fixed because it has been anchored within the substance of the septum transversum. So we are left with this middle portion, that is the bulbous cordis and the primitive ventricle. So the, these, this, this, these two uh, expansions of the heart tube, they will sink into the underlying pericardial cavity, and this will create the bulboventricular loop, which we talked about in the previous lecture. And this loop will rapidly grow in size. It will get elongated. And as a result of elongation, there will be, you know, folding of the tube upon e upon itself, right? So the bulbous cordis uh, will be lying comparatively anteriorly, uh, like ventrally and cordally, uh, as well as the ventricle. While once there is ventrocaudal bending of the cardiac loop is happening, it is going to pull the uh, receiving end or the venous end of the heart tube uh, upward and into the pericardial cavity. So uh, that will be the movement of the venous end or the atrium of the heart tube will be in a dorsocranial fashion. Okay, And this is how it appears by the end of the fourth week. And this illustration is showing us how the, uh, the common atrioventricular canal has been divided into a right channel and a left channel, okay, by the formation of the endocardial cushions. Okay, and these, this this illustration is, is showing us the development or or developed um, AV valves, the uh, the tricuspid valve on the right side and the bicuspid valve on the left side. Okay, so this was just a brief overview of what we have already have covered. Now let's start on with this topic. So we are going to discuss. We have we are dealt we have dealt with the atria. Uh, the 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 development of atria has been completed. The the AV canal has been divided. Now what is lying below the AV canal uh, is the ventricle, ventricular uh, chamber. 
okay so we know that uh, this primitive um, um, expansion of the um, heart tube is known as the bulbous cordis and bulbous cordis uh, has two components the proximal part of the bulbous cordis is known as the uh, so it's, it's, an, it's the expanded region while the distal portion of the bulbous cordis is like a tube and that is continuing itself in uh, with the uh, truncus arteriosus which is the outflow outflow uh, tract or the uh, the arterial end of the heart tube okay so we can say that the, the proximal expanded portion of the bulbous cordis is going to become the primitive right ventricle and uh, the conus cordis is going to become the outflow tract okay in the adult heart now what about the the, the actual ventricle the primitive ventricle is going to become the major portion of the left ventricle in the adult heart okay so if you recall from your dissection lab that if you, when you cut open the uh, the ventricles you you can appreciate that the, uh, each ventricle is having uh, a smooth uh, upper region which is like which which basically is the conus cordis because they are the the outflow tract so in the left ventricle you have the uh, vestibule of aorta from where the aorta is emerging that's a smooth part and then uh, in the right ventricle you have the infundibulum of the pulmonary trunk from where the pulmonary artery the stem of pulmonary artery is emerging from the right ventricle that is also a smooth region so you can say that the infundibulum in the right ventricle and the vestibule in the left ventricle they are representing the conus cordis which is the embryonic structure okay in the adult heart uh, while the, the the two ventricles they also have the trabeculated part uh, the muscular part, which has a lot of trabeculae carni, they basically represent the primitive ventricle, that is the left ventricle, and the, uh, the proximal portion of the bulbous cordis, which is the adult right ventricle. Okay. Now, we, at this stage, we have to understand one more thing, that <clears throat> it's the cardiac progenitor cells forming the secondary heart field that the, those cells will play a major role in the development of right ventricle uh, and the interventricular septum which is going to divide the, the left ventricle for, uh, and right ventricle that the, the division will be complete like there will be no connection between the two chambers and then also uh, the secondary heart field cells are responsible for the partitioning of the outflow tract including the truncus arteriosus okay so it's mainly the secondary heart fields which are playing their role in this development okay these cells as we know they basically emerge in the uh, early embryo uh, on either side of the developing pharynx okay so these cells are under the control of neurochemical cells which arrive in the mesenchyme of the pharyngeal arches because they the secondary heart field develops on either side of the pharynx okay and the pharynx is is composed of a, like a bunch of pharyngeal arches and the mesenchyme of the pharyngeal arches receive the migrating neurochemical cells these neurochemical cells are going to uh, form multiple structures they are going to differentiate the pharyngeal mesenchyme and uh, the, the the pharyngeal mesenchyme will transform into the cartilage and the uh, musculature of the face and neck okay so therefore we can say that if there is a lack of arrival of neurocrest cells within the pharyngeal arches this will lead to the malformation of not only the facial features like such as the origin of cleft palate or cleft lip and many other facial deformities or malformations but it will also lead to certain heart defects and these heart defects mainly will include the ventricular septal defect that is vsd transposition of great arteries or great vessels uh, that is related to the partitioning of the conus cordis 
and they also the aortic or pulmonary valvular defect like your aortic stenosis or pulmonary stenosis because all these structures all these um, uh, structures are developing under the control of secondary heart field cells okay and the secondary heart field cells are under the command of neurogress cells okay? you have to keep this fact in mind Now, formation of the right and left ventricles. So by the end of the fourth week, the proximal portion of the bulbous cortex and the primitive ventricle will start expanding in like both caudally as well as laterally. Okay, so caudally or distally as well as laterally. So both the proximal end of the bulbous cortex as well as the ventricle, they will start expansion in all directions. Okay. The medial walls of both expanding chambers will become opposed and fused together, okay? Thus forming a small elevation, a, a small mesenchymal elevation, which is known as the, like it's the beginning of the interventricular septum. It's the primitive interventricular septum. This ridge, the muscular ridge, is representing the primitive interventricular septum. The proximal part of the bulbous cortex will become the right ventricular cavity, while the original primitive ventricle will become the left ventricular cavity. And I was talking about this, you know, trabeculated part and the smooth part, which is present in each chamber of, uh, in each, each ventricular chamber. So the trabeculated part is basically uh, the the actual bulbous cortex and the primitive ventricle, while the smooth part of each adult ventricle is actually the conus cortex, okay, in, in, in terms of embryology, okay. Now, the partitioning of ventricles and formation of the muscular part of the interventricular septum. So you have to keep in mind that the interventricular septum is not like interatrial septum. It is, it is, 70% uh, muscular and 30% membranous. It's not 100% muscular uh, partition, okay? So during the fourth week, a crescent-shaped muscular ridge, which was, you know, we just have seen in the previous slide, that's the primordial interventricular septum, that starts developing in the floor of the primitive ventricle or the junction between the primitive ventricle and the uh, proximal end of the bulbous cortex. Uh, Initially, the height of the primordial interventricular muscular septum will increase with the downward expansion because you know that the, the two chambers were expanding distally as well as laterally. So due to the downward expansion or distal expansion of both these chambers, the height of this ridge oh, over here, you can see. So as they are expanding distally and laterally, the, automatically this portion, the middle portion or midline portion is not increasing or it's not expanding. So due to the downward expansion, the height of this interventricular septum will increase automatically. Okay, That is the initial pattern of growth. Later on, with active proliferation of the myoblasts, cardiomyoblasts within the primordial interventricular septum, the muscular part of definitive interventricular septum is formed, okay? So initially there is just, it's just a, a small uh, muscular ridge and it, it increases in its height by just the lateral expansion of the two chambers. But later on the myoblasts will infiltrate this ridge and will, you know, increase its height further. At the beginning, so by the, by the beginning of the seventh week, a crescent-shaped interventricular foramen uh, will be present between the upper crescent-shaped margin of the inter muscular interventricular septum and the fused endocardial cushions. So you are looking at the, the heart from sideways. So you are able to appreciate this muscular interventricular septum, which grew like this and the upper margin of this muscular interventricular septum is free and it is of half moon shape, okay? And then there is a gap between the upper margin of the muscular septum 
and the fused endocardial cushions which are present in the atrioventricular canal. So this gap is known as it's wide, it's crescent shape, and it, this gap is known as the interventricular foramen through which the blood can enter from the right ventricle into the left ventricle and it can also enter from the left ventricle into the right ventricle right a two-way flow is possible mixing is possible now uh, so what we don't need the two ventricles to communicate with each other in the adult heart so we need the septum to be completed there should be a complete disconnect between the right and left ventricles so the remaining portion upper portion of the interventricular septum which is also known as membranous interventricular septum will develop later on in, 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 during the seventh week okay uh, and this membranous septum will be formed by the fusion of three structures so there will be uh, like you know that just close to the ventricles is the distal part of the bulbus cordis which is known as the conus cordis and the conus cordis is present it is present above the above both the ventricles okay so this conus cordis is going to become the outflow tract an outflow tract for the left ventricle an outflow tract for the right ventricle okay so uh, there will be a, a distinct partitioning that is required in the conus cordis to create these two outflow traps and that partitioning will start from the appearance of a right conal ridge and a left conal ridge so uh, in the wall in the right and left walls of the conus cordis the two mesenchymal ridges will appear the cells will start proliferating just like it was happening in the endocardial cushions formation the same method is here but but the, the only difference is these cells the proliferation of these cells is completely under the control of the neural crest cells you have to keep in mind okay so that these ridges are known as right conal ridge and the left conal ridge so these the, the two ridges will fuse in the midline and will, will, will form a, a, a conal septum, okay? The conal septum will continue itself upward into the truncus uh, arteriosus, so that's why we call it a conotruncal septum, okay? But normally, you just have to understand that this, this septum is present in the conus cordis and it is dividing the conus cordis into a right and a left or rather an anterior and a posterior outflow tract so anterior outflow tract is you know we'll talk about it in the next slide we just have to remember that the membranous part of the interventricular septum is composed it's being formed by the fusion of the right and left conal ridges which are forming the conal septum and the fused endocardial cushion so these three structures when they fuse together, they give rise to the, the membranous part of the interventricular septum. Okay? You can see that this septum is not developing from a single source. It requires three sources. So anything can go wrong. The fusion can be incomplete or it can be completely not there. So there are more chances of uh, ventricular septal defect in this membranous part of the septum. Okay, so development of the conal ridges and their fusion with the endocardial cushion is, is as I just have told you, it's under the strict control of neural crest cells. And the interventricular foramen closes. So this foramen will close down at the end of the seventh week. Uh, and after the seventh week of intrauterine life, there will be no connection between the two ventricular cavities and there will be no connection between the uh, uh, right and left atria except for a region which is known as the foramen ovale so through foramen ovale which is like a slit like opening the right ventricular uh, right atrial blood will be entering the left atrium which we discussed in the previous lecture okay and we need to to understand a concept that an underdevelopment of any of these sources right conal left conal ridges and the fused endocardial cushion will lead to the malformation of the membranous part of interventricular septum 
that will result in a ventricular septal defect. So sometimes the fusion between the two endocardial cardial cushions is incomplete. That again will lead to a malformed membranous interventricular septum. Okay, so you have to understand that this middle region is the, the, the fusion of this, these structures which are present in this middle of the heart between the atria and the ventricle is under the control of neural crest cells. And if something happens uh, during the migration of neural crest cells, that will result in the malformation of either of these structures. Okay. Now, uh, the VSDs or ventricular septal defects are the most common congenital malformations of the heart occurring, they can occur uh, as an isolated condition. Just a VSD will exist. It will not have any other uh, coexisting malformations. And that can occur, that can occur as an isolated defect in 12 out of 10,000 live births, okay? And among the, uh, the VSDs, the muscular VSDs are 80% of the septal defects, ventricular septal defects are of muscular origin, okay? They are present in the muscular part of the interventricular septum. But the good news is that they do, they, they, they are common, but they get close by the time a child grows because there will be proliferation of uh, myoblasts or the myocardial cells which are going to cover up this defect in, in, in future. As the, as the child will grow, the, these holes in the muscular part of interventricular septum will automatically be closed, off, closed down, okay? While the membranous VSDs are the serious type and they do not close on their own because the defect is lying in the malfusion of either of the three sources, okay? So the, the membranous VSD will never close off, down on its own. Okay, they are almost always associated with the abnormalities of the conotruncal septum, which we just have discussed. Uh, uh, there is always some mixing of venous and arterial blood depending upon the size of the defect. If the defect is a small, there will be hardly any mixing. If the defect is like complete, like the, uh, uh, the, the membrane septum is completely absent, there will be a frank mixing of a right, a right ventricular and left ventricular blood, okay? So that definitely is going to cause a condition which, which will be cyanotic heart disease, okay? And there is a very good video which you should watch, I would recommend, okay? Uh, then the partitioning of the truncus arteriosus and conus cordus, and it is really a little bit tricky to understand because it requires a lot of 3D imagination. Okay, but I will try my best to make you understand. So during the fifth week, a pair of opposing ridges, will, they will appear in the walls of truncus arteriosus. Okay, that's the outflow tract. One, that one of these swellings or ridges will appear in the right superior wall of the truncus arteriosus. And this ridge, or swelling will descend down, starting from the superior wall of a superior uh, part of the right wall of truncus arteriosus, and will descend down. It will move inferiorly and will reach the left left wall of the truncus arteriosus. Okay, that's one ridge. The other ridge will appear in the inferior wall uh, oh i just am mixing it up so the right superior swelling will grow downward and to the left while the left inferior swelling will go will grow up and towards the right okay in this way they are going to create a crisscross okay and that is basically is you know foreshadowing the spiral septum and this spiral septum is known as the aorticopulmonary septum, exclusively aorticopulmonary septum, because it is going to divide the truncus arteriosus into uh, an anteriorly lying aorta and a posteriorly lying 
uh, pulmonary trunk. Okay. Now, if we trace it down, we have our conus cordis. So here, this was the truncus arteriosus, which has been divided, and the portion uh, which is distal or proximal to the truncus arteriosus is known as the conus cordis. So this is the distal part of the truncus arteriosus, and this is the proximal part of the conus ar uh, uh, truncus arteriosus, which is attached to the conus cordis, or it's in continuity with the conus cordis. Okay. So once the truncus arteriosus is showing its partition, at the same time, the conus cordis is also dividing. Okay. Uh, and the at, at the, the two ridges we just talked about, the right and left conal ridges, they will appear in the walls of the conus cordis and they will fuse in the midline and will divide the, this outflow tract into an anterior pulmonary trunk and a, 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 like the, the, uh, the um, infundibulum of the pulmonary trunk and the vestibule of the aorta. Okay, so the vestibule of aorta is in continuity with the left ventricle and the infundibulum of the pulmonary trunk is in continuity with the right ventricle. So if you recall from your adult heart anatomy, which you have seen in the lab, that the right ventricle is located anterior to the left ventricle. If you place the heart in normal anatomical position, you can picture it well that the right ventricle is dominating the anterior surface, while the left ventricle is lying behind the right ventricle. Okay, so we can say that there is a anterolateral uh, infundibulum of the pulmonary trunk and a posteromedial uh, vestibule of the aorta. Now, if you look here at the distal end of the truncus arteriosus, you can see that the aorta, so it's no more truncus arteriosus, these are the two great arteries emerging from the two ventricles of the heart. So you can see that the aorta at the level of conus cordis is lying behind the pulmonary trunk. Like it, this is the pulmonary trunk and lying behind the pulmonary trunk is the aorta because your aortic vestibule is posteromedial while your pulmonary infundibulum is anterolateral. Okay. But as you progress towards the distal end of truncus, right, you can see that the aorta, it just comes to the front. Now, at the top, at the top region, you can see that the aorta is lying in front or anterior to the pulmonary trunk in, in the adult anatomy. So that's why this spiraling is required to correspond like a proper communication or connection between the aorta which is lying anteriorly but it is coming from behind so there is a spiraling which is required the normal spiraling which is under the strict control of the arrival of neural crest cells within the pharyngeal arches if the neural crest cells fail to arrive or, or if less number of neural crest cells have arrived there will be failure of a spiraling of the aorticopulmonary septum. This spiraling will be missing. Okay, and we'll see what will happen after that. And we know that the conal ridges also participate in the formation of membranous part of interventricular septum. So any failure of fusion of the two conal ridges will result in the formation of, or, or the uh, result in the origin of ventricular membranous VST. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is the illustration which is explaining in much more detail. This is a model of an adult heart where you can see that the aorta, so at the beginning, this is the right ventricle and this is the left ventricle. So the aorta is emerging from behind the pulmonary trunk, okay, at the level of the ventricles. But if you move upward, the aorta moves or the, the aorta slides to the front. Okay, that's what I was talking about. And this is how the septum is being uh, 
formed and the spiraling is very necessary for the connection, the connectivity of aorta with the left ventricle and pulmonary trunk with the right ventricle. Okay. Now, once the aorta and the pulmonary trunk, the two great arteries have been formed, like the truncus arteriosus has been partitioned and the two tubes have been formed. This, the superior surfaces, oh, sorry, the, 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 so the, like we just are looking at one of the vessels, say for example, say this is aorta, okay? So you're looking at the base of the aorta from where it is emerging from the uh, left ventricle. At that point, the uh, primordia of the semilunar valves appear as three tubercles, like the, the mesenchymal bu bulges, right? They will appear uh, in the proximal end of the truncal swellings, okay? So the, you know the truncal swellings have divided the truncus arteriosus into uh, the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. And now when we are examining a single tube, say we are examining the aorta, we can say that the, the proximal portion of the aorta, which is attaching itself to the left ventricle, at that point, the three mesenchymal tubercles or swellings will appear. These are the primordia of the uh, semilunar valves. Now, the superior surfaces of these swellings will become concave as a result of cell death due to apoptosis. So the programmed cell death will occur at the superior surface of these tubercles. And that will result in the concavity of these uh, like uh, tubercles at the vascular surface, over the vascular surface. You can say that these concave half moon shaped shaped valves will come into being okay so there, there there are three cusps that will be formed because there are three swellings and these these cusps are like they look like half moons so they are known as semilunar valves and due to their architecture they these valves will behave like a unidirectional valve Right? They, will, they will make sure that the, uh, the blood flow is always in unidirection. Because once the blood has, from the ventricle, the blood has entered the vessel, the, the pressure of blood will approximate these three cusps and there will be no backflow or there will be no backflow of blood from the aorta to the left ventricle or from the pulmonary trunk to the right ventricle. The insufficiency of these valves will lead to, or lack, a failure of closure of these valves will lead to pulmonary insufficiency or aortic insufficiency. And that means that every time during the systole, the, the, the ventricles have pumped blood into the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. And the, as a result of the failure of fusion of these valves, complete, complete um, fusion of these valves will result in to the trickling down of some of the blood back into the ventricular cavity. Okay, so we call it the cardiac insufficiency. Okay. Uh, then, uh, and we just have discussed that the neural crest cells are playing a major role in the formation and the alignment of these valves. Okay. Now, um, in case of pulmonary valve atresia, meaning complete uh, absence of any opening, or stenosis, meaning of the, the opening is of not, not normal size, it's much smaller than the normal size. So in case of the pulmonary semilunar valves, uh, fusion, abnormal fusion with each other during their development, um, as a result of uh, you know, failure of neural crest cells arrival or, uh, you know, uh, miscommunication between the mesenchyme of the uh, um, cusps and the neural crest cells that will result in the abnormal fusion of these valves. So uh, what will happen? The right ventricle will fail to develop in size 
resulting in the condition known as hypoplastic heart, right heart syndrome. Let's see. Here, the pulmonary valve is narrow. It's like either atritic or it's stenosed. So the, the right ventricle will not be able to pump blood to the uh, pul uh, pulmonary trunk because of the narrowing of the pulmonary trunk. Uh, not the pulmonary trunk, but the narrowing about diffusion of the pulmonary valve. Okay, so as, as a result, the right ventricle will not be functioning efficiently. Okay, and due to lack of functioning, the size of the right ventricle will, is, will be abnormally small. We call it hypoplasia of the right ventricle, okay, or hypoplastic right ventricle. And then it's not as an isolated defect. As a result, there will be pressure in the right atrium because the blood cannot trickle down to the right uh, ventricle. Because the reason is the pulmonary valves are not, they are fused together or they are, there is very little uh, space in between the valves. So the right ventricle cannot pump blood efficiently into the pulmonary trunk. So there will be less blood coming to the right ventricle staying more into the right atrium that there will be much higher pressure of blood in the right atrium and therefore there will always be an atrial septal defect even after birth the, the fusion of uh, uh, septum primum and septum secundum is not possible okay so the child will have will have the ASD along with the uh, right heart uh, hypoplastic syndrome and uh, there will be more pressure in the uh, left left side of the heart there will be higher pressure in the aorta so that will result in the persistence of ductus arteriosus or patent ductus arteriosus okay so these three malformations will be existing together that's why it is known as a syndrome Okay. And vice versa, in case of the, the abnormal fusion or closure of the aortic valves, uh, there will be a, a left ventricular hypoplasia. Okay, And this is also a syndrome because as a result, there will be the, the left ventricle will not be able to pump blood into the aorta due to the stenosis or atresia of the valves, there will, there will be back or regurgitation of this blood into the left atrium, okay. Again, left atrial pressure is high, so there will be failure of fusion of the premium, primum and secundum. Septum primum and secundum will not fuse, so the, there will be an atrial septal defect, okay. And to escape the pressure, uh, the, the, the patent duct, the, the, the ductus arteriosus will stay open. Okay, so these are the two conditions that can result if there is abnormal fusion of the aortic or pulmonary semilunar valves during the process of development. Okay, then there is a condition known as persistent truncus arteriosus. So what happens that the in this case, the conal ridges fail to appear. Either they fail to appear, or if they have appeared, they 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 fail they are failed to fuse together. Okay, so the result will be an undivided outflow tract. Okay, so the 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 proximal portion of the truncus arteriosus, which is in continuum with the conus cordis, and it gets divided once the conal septum is developed. So in this case, the conal ridges fail to appear or they are incomplete in fusion. So the conal septum is not formed. So the proximal end of the truncus arteriosus is a single tube. There is no demarcation. There is no partitioning between the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. Okay? Only the distal portion is divided. Okay? So, and along with that, another defect will be there. It will coexist with this persistent truncus arteriosus. And if you remember that the conal septum or the conal ridges contribute in the formation of the membranous part of the ventricular, interventricular septum. 
So because the ridges fail to appear, not only the truncus arteriosus will stay an undivided tube, it will persist even in the adult heart, but also there will be a missing membranous septum. So a, a frank VSD along with a persistent truncus arteriosus. It's a, again a cyanotic heart disease because there will be huge mixing between the right and left blood or the oxygenated and deoxygenated blood and that blood will be pumped like in a mixed fashion it will be pumped into the common truncus arteriosus and then will be distributed to the entire body through these uh, you know pulmonary and AO pulmonary artery and the aorta you know at the at the distal end of the truncus arteriosus okay This is a video, a very good video that is, you know, will help you understand the, uh, the, the partitioning of the atrioventricular canal and the outflow channels. Okay. I would recommend that you should watch this multiple times to make the concepts clear in your head. Then we have the, um, this is a, a small table which shows you the, uh, the ultimate, you know, destination of the, the embryonic structures and how they will become into adult forms okay so the primitive atria will transform into or in the adults they are, they are represented as the right and left auricles while the sinus venosus like the left horn of sinus venosus in the adult heart is represented as a coronary sinus and the oblique vein of the left atrium and the right horn of the coronary sinus or the um, uh, sinus venosus, it, because during the development of the right atrium, we discussed that the right horn completely absor gets absorbed in the posterior wall of the right atrium, right? So that the sinus venerum or the smooth part of the right atrium is representing the right horn of the sinus venosus in the adult heart. The bulbous cord is like the right ventricle, the trabeculated part of the right ventricle is representing the proximal uh, part of the bulbous cordis and the outflow tracts in both of the ventricles uh, is the is representing the conus cordis part of the bulbous cordis okay uh, the primitive ventricle is represented as the left ventricle in the adult heart and truncus arteriosus is represented as the ascending aorta in the pulmonary trunk in the adult heart okay the crista terminalis is the demarcation line which you when you when you create a flap in the right atrium the anterior wall of the right atrium you you just cut it open there is a demarcation line like a crista like a sharp edge which which indicates that where the right horn of the sinus venosus was incorporated into the right into the wall of the right atrium so there is a demarcation between the sinus venerum and the auricle that demarcation line is known as crista terminalis. Okay, now uh, the formation of the conducting system of the heart. Okay, and you have to remember that the conducting system of the heart is um, is the specialized, you know, uh, system. Although it doesn't develop from the ectoderm, but it is like a, it, it is capable of conducting impulses. Okay. It's mesodermal in origin, exclusively mesodermal in origin. And we know that the heart is an organ which is supposed to start working as soon as it is formed. Like we know that by the end of the day 21 or day 22, like in the third week, the, the first beating of hearts, a heart is like they, they are they are visible on the ultrasound. Okay, and by fifth week of intrauterine life you can trace the uh, the beating heart through ultrasound okay so the moment it is formed in fact it is still in the in the, in the making it starts working it, we we can say that the cardiovascular system is the first system to start working in the embryo while the nervous system is the first system to start appearing it appears first but it doesn't start working As the cardiomyocytes making the wall of the primitive heart tube have an innate ability to contract, 
just like any other muscle cells, the primitive heart tube starts asynchronous contractions from day 21 of intrauterine life. Then later on, a collection of specialized cardiomyocytes, which are known as the pacemaker cells, they will appear in the wall of sinus venosus, exclusively speaking, the right horn of sinus venosus. They will appear in the wall of the right horn of sinus venosus. And these cells will start controlling the contraction of the primitive heart tube. So initially, the contraction was just like myogenic in origin. But later on, uh, like a discrete system will come into being and that that the start of that system will be by the appearance of pacemaker cells and these pacemaker cells are specialized well differentiated cardiomyocytes uh, they, they, that will appear like a bundle a small groove in the wall of the right horn of sinus venosus okay once they appear they they take the lead they start controlling the contraction of the primitive heart tube um, and we know as the right horn of the sinus venosus will incorporate in the posterior wall of the right atrium the pacemaker tissue that bulk will come to lie near the opening of the supia vena cava in the posterior wall of the right atrium leading to the formation of sinoatrial node or sa node that's why physically or anatomically the sa node is located just beside the opening of the supia vena cava in the right atrium of the adult heart okay that's the reason because as the the sa node it was this initial base group of pacemaker cells that appeared in the right horn of sinus venosus and the sinus venosus right horn has made the sinus minerum okay and that's the region where the supia vena cava will open in the uh, right atrium after the formation of the interatrial septum so once the you know, the uh, partitioning has been completed in the atrial chambers. A small collection of modified, the same modified or specialized cardiomyocytes, they will be embedded in the distal portion of the septum, interatrial septum. They will transform into AV node and AV bundle, right? So we know that in the adult anatomy, the AV node is located just beside the um, um, endocardial cushion or like uh, uh, in the lower portion or the caudal portion of the interatrial septum. And the AV bundle is located in the uh, endocardial cushion area. That means it is located in the top part of the interventricular septum, the membranous interventricular septum. Okay. And the Purkinje system or the Purkinje fibers which are derived from the cardiac jelly that lose mesenchymal or connective tissue present around the primitive heart tube. That will give rise to the Purkinje system or the Purkinje fibers. And these Purkinje fibers will descend through the interventricular muscular septum and will spread across the ventricular walls, the musculature of the entire right and left ventricles. Okay. And we have to remember one more thing that the transcription factor TBX3 inhibits the process of differentiation of some, like a group of mes mesodermal cells into regular cardiomyocytes. The regular cardiomyocytes, which are, which have the ability to contract. So they, the, the transcription factor TBX3 will inhibit the differentiation of some of these uh, mesodermal cells into pro regular cardiomyocytes and will promote their differentiation into specialized conducting cells. So we have to remember that these conducting cells, which are capable of conducting the neural impulses, they are, they are not a part of ectoderm. They are mesodermal in origin. They are mesenchymal in origin. But they are highly specialized cells and this differentiation is completely under the control of transcription factor TBX3. Okay. And here you can see I just have given you a legend right over here. Uh, like the, the legends have been translated over here. 
and you can see that this is the primitive heart tube, the outflow tract, that is the truncus arteriosus and conus cordis. This is the inflow tract, that's the sinus venosus and the atrium, okay? As the heart tube is folding, so you know, this is the AV canal, atrioventricular canal, and this is the atrial portion, oh, sorry, this is the ventricular portion, this is the atrial portion, right? So, so ventrocaudal folding, and this is the dorsocranial folding, okay? So the atria will come to lie at the back of the back and top of the ventricles, even in the adult form, okay? So this is the region where the, uh, uh, what you call the, uh, uh, the right horn of the sinus venosus will have a collection of uh, pacemaker cells that will appear first in the right horn, okay? So, sorry, this labeling has been a little bit off. I am going to fix it. Uh, no, I cannot fix it anymore. It's just that I guess I expanded the illustration, so the labeling is off, and it's my bad. I just am going to explain it to you. So, once the right atrium, see, the right atrium is lying cranial to the right ventricle, and it's lying slightly behind. Okay? That's, that's how this 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 uh, orientation is established in the very beginning when the uh, the cardiac cardiac loop is folding okay so we come back to our conducting system so this is the sinoatrial node because this is the posterior wall of our right atrium and that posterior wall is known as the sinus venera, venerum because it's been formed by the absorption of the right horn of sinus venosus and the right horn of sinus venosus had this pacemaker cells collection. So they will get embedded in the wall, uh, posterior wall of the right atrium just beside the opening of the supia vena cava, okay? SA node. And then your AV node, which is like it's supposed to be here, AV node is located in the lower portion or the caudal portion of the interatrial septum, okay? AV node is following down at like the, like it's it's continuing down as the AV bundle. The bundle is present at the junction of the membranous part of the interventricular septum and the endocardial cushion. Okay, and then the Purkinje system or Purkinje fibers. Okay. Now a condition of like it's it's a syndrome known as tetralogy of fellow. Tetralogy because there are four defects existing together in the heart. It's the most common cyanotic congenital heart disease, okay? It is caused by the anterior displacement of the aorticopulmonary septum, leading to a narrowing of pulmonary trunk. Because if you remember, your anterior tube, anterolateral tube is the pulmonary trunk, while the posterior medial tube is the aorta. So if there is deflection or replacement or displacement of the aorticopulmonary septum more towards the anterior side or the ventral side, that will lead to the narrowing of the lumen of pulmonary artery or pulmonary trunk, okay? That will result, so for the first anomaly or malformation will be the stenosis of pulmonary trunk, narrowing of pulmonary trunk. As a result, there will be back pressure in the uh, um, ventricles, okay, especially the right ventricle. As a result, there will be, you know, incomplete development or fusion of the membranous part of the interventricular septum, okay. So, there will be a VSD of varying degree. Depending upon the size of the stroke, if, if, if there is a complete atresia of the pulmonary trunk, there will be a complete absence of membranous interventricular septum. But if there is a partial stenosis, there will be incomplete, or, the, the, or in other words, the VSD will be smaller. Okay? Now, what happens that the, the, the aorta will be trying, it will try to cover up this ventricular septal defect. So it is going to lie on top of the muscular interventricular septum. So we call it the overriding of aorta, which is trying to hide this or, or, or you know, fix this defect, VSD. Okay? 
So there will be overriding of aorta. And then there will be right ventricular hypertrophy. In fact, I should have written the pulmonary stenosis leading to right ventricular hypertrophy, leading to ventricular septal defect, and the ventricular septal defect will be, well, the aorta will try to cover up the ventricular septal defect. So that condition is known as overriding of aorta. So these four defects are, will lead to a frank mixing of vena, of uh, deoxygenated and oxygenated blood and the mixed blood will be pumped through the aorta into the entire, uh, through the, left, uh, through the, you know, uh, from the aorta to the uh, entire body. Okay, it's a very good illustration. Oh, sorry, it's a good, good video. It is going to give you like a, it's going to clarify your concept if you watch it. Okay. Then the last condition is known as the transposition of great vessels or TGA, transposition of great arteries. Okay, that can happen as a result of failure of a spiraling of the aorticopulmonary septum. And we know that the spiraling of aorticopulmonary septum is strictly under the control of neural crest cells. So if something goes wrong with the migration of the neural crest cells into the uh, pharyngeal arches, that will lead to defective facial features like a cleft palate or, or um, um, cleft lip, and uh, uh, accompanying these facial defects will be the defects of the heart, and especially the defect of the aorticopulmonary septum, failure of a spiraling. And, and that will lead to the, the condition in which the pulmonary trunk will be emerging from the, because there is no spiraling at the top level of the truncus arteriosus. So the pulmonary trunk or the pulmonary artery will be originating from the left ventricle and the aorta will be emerging from the right ventricle because if you remember in the adult anatomy the aorta is lying anterior to the pulmonary trunk so anterior chamber is the right ventricle aorta will be emerging from the right ventricle because the twisting did not happen and the pulmonary trunk will be emerging from the left uh, ventricle because there was twisting uh, uh, there was twist, no twisting okay so as a result, the, there will be, again, huge mixing and the deoxygenated blood will be pumped from the right ventricle into the aorta and the oxygenated blood will be pumped back into the, the uh, pulmonary circulation, okay? And uh, like a, there will be a huge pressure in the uh, right ventricle. So as it is a right ventricle and right atrium. So as a result, there will be uh, um, an ASD and a patent ductus arteriosus, okay? Just to balance the pressure between the right and left sides of the heart. So a compensation, this is the compensa compensatory mechanism when the uh, child is born with the transpos transposed great arteries, there will be an accompanying atrial septal defect and a patent ductus arteriosus. Okay, I think that is the end of our lecture. And you know that the next lecture is about the development of the blood vessels. Thank you.